Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Emmanuel Platt. I'm the uh, director of merchandising for MoMA Design Store. Every year during NYC by Design, which is a celebration of design in the city in May, we document something at the MoMA Design Store that is relevant to what's happening in the design field. And as we search for products scouting the world, we started to see more and more projects coming from France, especially uh, objects integrating technology. So we were like, well, something is going on. So we need to understand what is that story. This is how this evening came about. So we met with uh, the people from La French Tech and Business France, and we learned a lot about the robust ecosystem that exists today in France, and that explains partly why you have all these wonderful projects that we have. Uh, we've selected 20 objects tonight that you can see upstairs when we, we're done with this panel. Uh, but there were so many others, so there's a real wave of talents and um, creativity happening in France, and, and there's a real structure that enables that creativity to, ex to exist. So, tonight we have four wonderful uh, people uh, to my right. I will let Greg Lindsay, uh, who is our moderator, moderator tonight, introduce our panelists. But Greg himself is a journalist, he's an urbanist, he's a futurist. You're, you're a bit of everything, it's quite remarkable. Uh, you actually collaborated with an uh, architect studio called Studio Gang in 2012, whose work was featured at MoMA. Uh, so you have a connection with us. Uh, but before we, we start to, uh, that conversation, I want to thank a, a number of people. Obviously, uh, the people from uh, La French Tech and Business, Business France for their support, their guidance uh, throughout this, um, the creation of this program. But I also want, obviously, to thank um, the MoMA team and many, many people in the MoMA team's work on this project. And finally, I really want to praise the designers, uh, all the startups that we are celebrating tonight, because uh, we really want to celebrate their passion, their courage, and uh, their enthusiasm, and for believing in their ideas. Some of these companies are real, you know, small operation, one-man show, so it's quite remarkable that tonight we can feature their work at MoMA, and I'm really, really pleased for uh, many of them. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this evening. I want to uh, thank um, Anne-Claire Legendre, Consul General de France, for being here tonight with us. Uh, I know there's many uh, French people in the room, so merci beaucoup, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry, thank you all so much for coming. Um, uh, my name is Greg Lindsay, and um, I, 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 I'm laughing at the incongruity uh, of me speaking here to a room full of, of native francophones. Uh, I come from a small town in Illinois that was founded by a Canadian, uh, French-Canadian fur trapper named Nul de Vassour, uh, a town called Bourbonnais, and uh, the kindergarten they named after him is referred to by my mother as Lavasser, and the town is known as Bourbonis. So please pardon me if I mangle every French word that comes out of my mouth tonight. Um, but before we begin here, I'd like to introduce my panelists who are game enough to be here to discuss La Franche Tech and design. Uh, so to my immediate left is Letitia Gazelle uh, Antoine, uh, who is the founder of Connect, I know I mangled it already, <laughs> Connect Things, uh, founder, the founder of Connect Things in 2007. Uh, to her left, there is Christian Brun uh, from ISKN, which I will encourage you again at the, at the end of this panel to go up and play with and see demos with, uh, which he'll talk about, an amazing product and in terms of well, design itself and also in how you design. Uh, and then at the far left is, uh, is, of course, Pascal Kegli, who is the chairman of Business France and spent a dozen years inside of Apple, which we'll get into in just a moment as well. Um, so as a sort of scene setter for this, for this discussion, uh, given that it's New York Design Week, um, I'm always, one of the most inspiring design books that I've ever read uh, is actually by a Japanese writer, uh, Junichiro Taniyazaki, uh, called In Praise of Shadows. Uh, in which he mused, what if so many sort of central Western technological inventions uh, of the early 20th century and the late 19th century, the light bulb, the steam engine, the automobile, had been invented by the Japanese rather than in the West? How would have it embodied Japanese aesthetics rather than being retrofitted into their culture? And so one of the things we're gonna talk a bit about tonight is, is give
given the overweening importance of Silicon Valley and Silicon Valley's importance in designing not just many of the technologies we all have in our pockets, uh, but also you know, how we think about entrepreneurship, how we think about technology, and how we think about the merger of technology and design. Um, so with that, we have three excellent panelists here who will discuss uh, what I like to think of as an another tech world as possible, a French world in which the French dominate design and dominate technology and what that world would look like. Um, so with that, we'll get into our first question. And that is my first question, I suppose, is you know, what, what, what makes French tech French, I suppose. What are the embodied characteristics of it? What are the cultural expressions of it? When I think about a French technology company, what makes it different than one that comes out of California? Because, and I say this, the one that comes out of California, uh, you know, comes from the firms that relocated there in the 1930s and the sort of whole mythos and ethos that came out of that. Um, so I'll, I'll have Pascal answer this first. And I should note, by the way, I was asked to make a disclaimer um, due to political uh, sensitivities here that Pascal had no role in selecting our other panelists here. They were chosen by MoMA. Um, but Pascal, if you could talk a bit about you know, what makes French tech and design French versus what you saw at Apple uh, and sort of the California approach to this. And of course, you know, the French have always been essential in designing Apple. Jean-Louis Gasset was one of my favorite tech interviews ever. Um, but, but yeah, what is the essence of it? No, I think it's a very tough question, but uh, I'm one I'm very pleased to answer. Um, no, Steve was saying that design is not about how it looks, but about how it works. And I think one of the talents of the French over the centuries have been to try to find this amazing way of uh, doing something which is aesthetically superb, with the right materials, the French flair, the elegance which is unique. But in the meantime, uh, we have a tradition of engineering which is unique. And um, in my role of ambassador for uh, foreign uh, international investments, I have to tell you that France has to offer today something very unique. We've got thousands of engineers, a stock of them, which is as many as Germany. And the old job has been over the last year, thanks to the French tech, to essentially mobilize them towards um, creating this French tech and recreating new products. And when you say that, um, I'm not going to borrow your figures, but when you have, like every clock, every year, 40,000 young kids going on the market, when you have 75 PhD, when you have 25% of the medal fields, which is the Nobel Prize of the maths, when you've got a stock of a million of engineers and you know how to do space rockets, nuclear engines, a um, few cars, and many other stuff, and you have these digital revolutions coming to fruition, you try to basically take the hardware, the key components on it, to took a piece of new materials, a low layer software, and then a beautiful user interface. And all what you see here, uh, upstairs on the 20 product which has been selected is a mixture of that. That's what, why the Internet of Things becomes so important. has been embraced by uh, talented uh, engineers uh, in Grenoble, here in New York, or in Paris. And I think it's just kind of um, the illustrations of a French Renaissance. Um, and obviously I, I wouldn't be saying that if I would not add also an amazing new president, President Macron, which came here. And there is a buzz, something of the massive cultural shift in France, which is something unique. I wait for that 20 years. I spent 20, 30 years crossing the Atlantic going in California. But you've got today, on the 25, 18, 25 years generations, less than basically 10% of them just five years ago were claiming that they would love to become an entrepreneur. In just five years, 55 to 60% state that the hero of the modern time will be the entrepreneurs. So that cultural shift is illustrated uh, by basically the 20 beautiful products you've got here. Uh, Leticia, are you? Yeah, yeah, and I think in, um, in addition to this uh, strong foundation about uh, engineer, and uh, uh, we, we have also a new mindset in France where all the entrepreneurs and, uh, are looking not only to France, but really abroad. And this combination of both uh, the talents plus this uh, open mindset make also France uh, very powerful today. Yeah. And, and Kristen, can you talk a bit about the origins of ASCAN? Because one of the things I think is interesting about the California, you know, they literally call it the California ideology, which is, you know, the heroic, always male entrepreneur who creates something from nothing, Peter Thiel, zero to one, with no one's help. And really, the, the foundations of Silicon Valley are based on universities, state investment, all of that. And that's sort of the story of ASCAN as well. It was, it was a university project, correct? It's a government-sponsored... Government 
But to, but to answer your, your question about what makes French technology special, I actually like the idea of saying that, and this is actually back to a meeting I had yesterday with a, a potential big US business partner. And at the end of the conversation, they said, well, what we like about your product is that you add spirit to technology. And I thought, oh, this is interesting because uh, you know, technology often is, is kind of cold. Uh, it's about features, uh, but adding spirit because our product is a best of both worlds, so basically analog and digital. And I kind of like that concept of adding spirit to technology. Yeah, I was, I was, I was going to say, I was, I was curious if you had other examples of Pascal, since you did not choose these two up here, if there's others that come to mind in this that are particularly French to you in that regard. Um, so one example that I think is interesting is I spend a lot of time in mobility, uh, working for Mini and for LA Commotion, uh, is that I think the, the first autonomous vehicle that most people will ever take is actually from one of a pair of French companies, Navia and Easy Mile uh, and Keolis and Transdev. Um, they, sh they run the ubiquitous electric shuttles that are everywhere. And I think it's fascinating that basically France has very quietly cornered a piece of the, uh, the autonomous mobility market and no one knows about this. So I was curious, if, you know, what there some other startups, other companies that would embody to you what is French design technology? No, you, you may all have heard about Nest, right? Uh, which was funded by a close friend of mine and sold them to go. And the idea was essentially to do a beautiful products full of aluminiums with the right digital space to address a fundamental issue is that a big share of the carbon footprint in the world comes from the homes, right? And if you can regulate and manage the way you are heating up your home, you can save a lot of energy and do something good. And that's the spirit as that we're talking about, right? And that's also what we are teaching now in business school, which is the why, right? Why is it that when you do a startup, why is it that you're doing what you do? So to answer your questions, I think I had, or I, I'm an investor in, in my real life, if I may say. And I also crossed the path of amazing company, like uh, the one which has been creating something which still exists today, which is Netatmo, which is essentially something about the quality of the air, beautifully designed, which is also something about the smoke detector. And today, doing basically addressing the issues of uh, of uh, external security. So that's one. But let's make, zoom back about what France has been also in the 50s and 60s. Not that I want to talk like an oldie, but we should all remember that uh, brands that you may recall like Moulinex, Seb, SEB, right? I've got the leadership positions and they essentially filling your kitchens with good and great products. Going close to what is about France, which is the kitchens, right? We've got some of the most beautiful aesthetically uh, superb uh, kitchens and, and tools around that. So I'll just tell you that there is something about France which is essentially how into your day-to-day -day living you are trying to bring the, the beau, right? Uh, not mentioning that we've got um, an history uh, of, uh, of savoir-faire in this area. Uh, the space uh, machine that we've been building, the Mirage, right, uh, are something unique. Uh, Peugeot and uh, Renault may not be as prestigious as today of the Mercedes uh, BMW of this world, but still they always have some amazing concept products. So all of that to tell you that at the end of the day, there is a tradition, um, an history, a legacy of doing that type of things. And when you are able to do exactly what you're doing, which is essentially put software, hardware together, you get to what you see today. Well, it's coming back to the, so the Tisha, again, connect things 2007. So you've been at this a very long time in the same company. Um, Speak more broadly about sort of how the internet has changed over the last 10 years. I mean, the smartphone that we all have in our pockets now was found, it was essentially created by Apple the year that you founded the company. And um, I'm curious your thoughts on like what, you know, coming back to my original question about, you know, what technology culture would look like if it had been truly invented by France or embodied by France. Um, you know, what's your vision for Connect Things? Because I'm, I'm, I'm sure most people aren't totally familiar with it. Um, and I'm curious about your vision of what the internet and the internet of things could be versus sort of where we are now and where it went wrong. And I think we all have a feeling because of Facebook, who I believe was in Brussels this week answering to the EU about what went wrong there, that something has gone awry. And I'd be curious your thoughts about how things have changed in the last 11 years and how we can fix them again from your perspective. Uh. So yes, um, I founded Connect Things 11 years ago. At that time, it was the beginning of the iPhone. So iPhone, the first iPhone was launched. Uh, so um, uh, I was uh, working for years on the mobile uh, industry and mobile internet uh, that came from Europe, in fact. And um, uh, with, uh, with um, the iPhone, 
uh, the new, new possibilities arrive because you have your mobile in your pocket, you can do internet and you can get information when you are in, in, in the city. So the idea of, uh, on which we, we, we founded Connect Things was to create a link between the cities, the object in the cities, uh, with the people through their mobile phone. So obviously at that time, we don't have all the location intelligence uh, on which we work today. It was really very simple link between uh, the end user and the bus stop, for example. And through a QR code, NFC, RFID, this kind of technology, we create a link to provide them the information they need when they are at the, uh, when they are at the bus stop. So very simple. Today, it's, it's uh, very different because the technology allows us to, uh, to do a virtual link between the end user through his mobile phone and the cities. We don't need to put any uh, uh, hardware, but in a way, it's always the same object that uh, uh, trigger the mobile application in the mobile phone. So you arrive at the bus stop, you will have your uh, mobile phone or your mobile application about transit uh, that will be wake up uh, at a specific place because you need it. So here we arrive at the privacy level because to do that, you need to track the end user in the mobile application. And I think it's again a great chance for France and for Europe because we are at a time where you know all about Facebook, sorry, you people just now think that privacy is something, that they have a lot of data everywhere, but uh, uh, do you want to erase it? It's impossible, you don't know. You don't know what, what brands and uh, uh, applications have about you. And, and that's where the GDPR, you are, most of you are aware about these new privacy rules in Europe, where uh, us, as a French or European company, we have something to say uh, to the American uh, market to explain then that because we have these roles and it's an obligation in, in Europe, we can provide this level of privacy here in the service we deliver in the, in the US. So again, I think it's a, it's a good moment for the, this law is something very strong and uh, we could have a, a bad effect on the, on the business in Europe. But I think really with all the concern we have about privacy, it's a, it's a chance for European and French company to be here and to help uh, also American services to, 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 to respect uh, the privacy of the user. Greg, I think, I think we should say that w we don't think it's a bad thing. Uh, we really believe that uh, the General Data Protection Regulations, which is this uh, ugly acronym GPDR, is doing three fundamental stuff, right? Essentially, it allows you to essentially uh, have the right to be forgotten which we believe, uh, having created in 1789s the Déclaration de l'Homme, right, du citoyen, that is a fundamental right. It does a second fundamental benefit, which is the right of portability. So that from one country to another, right, you have all the current metadata which follows you. And the third one is that in order to fight, which is a disease for the normal life, uh, and which is actually a crime, to fight against the cyber attacks, You've got 72 hours to basically raise your hands and declare the kind of cyber attacks that you have been a victim of. So you see, it's three fundamental principle. Here in the US, you've got something called the Patriot Act, by which me, Uncle Sam, or the Eye of Moscow can state to any company, give me your data, right? It's a different stance. I think I am personally, and we all in Europe, on the verge of this 25th of May, right, which is going to be the date where the GPDR is going to get into, uh, into power, if I may say, we're really about rallying the fringe of the people in the US, which also wants to define not a regulations, but a frame, a law. And we know that once we'll do that together, we'll have to go to China to basically work. And it's fundamental, because if we basically police in a positive way, the way you and I, we basically share and exchange data, that's going to enable a new renaissance with the intelligence, artificial intelligence and the world of the data. So that's really why I think this ugly GPDR uh, acronym, acronyms is actually, actually a fundamental stance. And uh, for once, we have the arrogance of the Europeans. We believe that we're showing the way to our uh, friends and cousins from America. 
I, I was going to say, between, between uh, I, I never knew until this past week or so that so many brands that I had completely forgotten about were very interested in my privacy and wanted to let me know about it. It's been very fun getting those emails. And between that and banning Uber, I mean, I'm enjoying the French model of the internet already. Um, so uh, you, you need no, no uh, convincing to me. Um, before we continue that vein, Christian, because you've been patient, I want, I want to hear more about IS Can here because I want you to talk a bit about, and particularly, I mean, you know, uh, Apple, of course, uh, going touching upon Pascal's past here, of course, Apple, you know, uh, famously back in the original Steve Jobs days, uh, was infamous for its not invented here syndrome. You know, if it was not created inside of Apple itself, it was sort of considered suspects and rejected. And the new Apple, when, when Steve returned, of course, was an amalgam of all sorts of interesting acquired technology, its own processors, its own things like this. And so I was hoping you could talk a bit about what's embodied. In, in your product and sort of where, what, what fields it draws upon, what, what, what sort of transnational expertise it draws upon as sort of this new model of France because yes, I mean, France also itself had a not invented here syndrome until very recently. Well, I think that our story is actually a, a good example because uh, we're basically a, a spin-off of a government-sponsored lab called the CEA, the CEA. Um, so, and that lab was actually developing nanotechnologies uh, nanotechnologies are technologies that all mobile phones carry. They're accelerometers, magnetometers, and gyroscopes. So they're the tools that help you position yourself three-dimensionally or count, you know, how many steps you've been war walking that today. Um, so basically, uh, uh, research uh, with an applied uh, technology uh, and, and an idea, you know, how can we convert that technology into a product and also, you know, who could be our users and, and make sure uh, we have s something that will appeal. So, so the technology actually, I'm, I'm always using this uh, because I think it, it's, uh, it's a great teaser, but that's the technology. You know, this small metallic ring is actually a magnet and our product is actually a, a drawing pad and the drawing pad will capture the magnet, meaning that as a drawer or a sketcher doing that either as a hobby or basically as, as a business, uh, whatever I'll be starting to sketch and draw using my paper and my own pen, and that's very important because there's a real, it's, it's a sensual thing, you know, to use your own pens and your own paper. But at the same time, everything that I will be drawing will be captured digitally. And that means, you know, being able to enrich, but also speaking about the internet, being able to share. So essentially, I'm able to share my drawings to the whole world almost instantly after having drawn it on a, uh, on a piece of paper. Uh, question building off of that, uh, which I think is significant, is, you know, I mean, the, again, the iPhone is 10 years, 11 years old now. The smartphone paradigm has reached maturity and ubiquity. And we're at this sort of, you know, uh, um, tipping point where we're, we're moving on to the next interface. The early money, of course, is on the AI voice recognition or chatbots, things like this. Um, you know, in your case, Christian, what, what would a mature version of that product look like? The internet is everywhere. We draw on any surface. It becomes a tactile pen and paper medium. I'm curious your thoughts on, you know, yeah, if you became the size of Apple, what would the world look like? I think it's, it's I mean, obviously, we're, we're constantly developing and improving the technology. But I think the one thing we've learned is that, uh, you know, to keep building hardware or, you know, once you've uh, uh, put to market a product and then already thinking about the next generation is, is, is a constant race and it puts a lot of pressure and, and it's not necessarily the, 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 the wise thing to do. We're more thinking about having a technology and to allow more users to use it by developing a, uh, an application ecosystem. Uh, so for example, if tomorrow you'd like to learn how to draw at home, how do you do it today, you know? You may not have uh, someone teaching you uh, next door, you may not have a school nearby, but you still would like to do it at home. Well, it's, it's the application that potentially will allow that. And if you start thinking about the ecosystem around the, the physical technology, so the hardware, where suddenly it opens many doors and many opportunities in terms of different user groups, uh, different age, age groups as well. Uh, so, in t so thinking about future developments 
it's really, obviously, there will be hardware. We're improving constantly. But it's also, and even more important strategically, it's the ecosystem that we will be building around that. And then, and Letitia, your thoughts as well on this, because I think, I think it was almost 30 years ago that it was Mark Weiser who was at Xerox Park, where, of course, Steve Jobs got the inspiration for the, for the Macintosh, came up with the notion of ambient computing, in which computing would be everywhere. It would be embodied in the design of objects of this. So, I mean, I'm curious, you think, I mean, is it going to be gestural? With, with, with the, internet, the internet of things is truly ubiquitous and design is built in, computing is built in every design. How do you think we'll interface it? Or what do you think is the evolution of connect things? <clears throat> So uh, what I think is that today the, the smartphone that we all have in uh, our pocket will disappear because I think it's really uh, to have something in the hand. It's not, uh, it's deep, it's, uh, it's not uh, easy and, and so on. So I think that we will simplify this, thank you, <laughs> this, this interface. And uh, 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 if you remember, obviously, the Google Glass, so it was not perfect, it was uh, too complicated. I don't want to put glass because I don't need glass and so on. But I think it's, uh, it shows us uh, that uh, all, um, instead of one thing, we could have uh, something that is, uh, so to have a display on your hand or to, uh, uh, the, the, sm the smartwatch is also very interesting. So for me, this will be split in some sensor and, uh, so I think that's uh, the future of the smartphone. And, and, Pasc and, and Pascal, I mean, you were there when they developed the tablet at Apple, and you probably, I don't know if, if Newson was inside there, but of course Newson and I have we're, we're, we're worked on the Apple Watch together. I mean, the best designers in the world have no, been trying to solve this problem uh, for Apple, too. Greg, I, I was there when we looked first at iPhones, and the menu there, uh, in the early days, where no one of us knew what it is. And when, and when and was I that, totally by the way? Disagree, How? I totally disagree with you, Leticia, right. right? Finally, conflict. Um, totally. Uh, the phone is here to stay, damn it, for the next decade. Um, because it's totally ubiquitous, it becomes part of your body, the material will change, uh, and there is, you believe that we're in maturity stage? I don't think so. The workman basically had a li life of 30 years. When we launched the iPod, in order to position the iPod, we were stating that this is the workman of the 21st century. We said that for six months, and then I was actually forbidding all my staff to talk about the Walkman because the concept was to create essentially a generic product like the Kleenex, like the Frigidaire, right? And we made it. The iPod is the iPod. The iPad is the tablet. And the phone, whether or not you like it on the Xiaomi or Samsung, is the iPhone. So I believe there is a legacy, a resilience, uh, a recurrence on that which is going to last. Now we will change and morph with new materials. It will. Will you be able to deport some of the capabilities on other device, which is exactly what you do, and what you see on the product of apps? Absolutely. But the truth of the matter is becoming one of the best companions of the human being. I'm not saying that because I've got, obviously, a vested interest, is that I fundamentally believe that we're nothing close to uh, see the uh, iPhone disappearing. I wouldn't mistake saying that you've got an install base of 1.3, 1.5, maybe 2 billions, right? Think about it, we have $7 billion on the planet. By 2050, when you and I will get no air or gray air, or in more than I have today, we'll be at $9 billion. So the, 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 the sky is the limit. Uh, and we have to live with it. You may not like it, but the hard fact is that it's here to stay. Well, I would say I'm, I'm personally a believer in uh, the venture capitalist uh, Benedict Evans at Andreessen Horowitz has a saying that uh, technologies achieve their platonic form at precisely their moment of obsolescence makes perfect sense. The moment, the moment they, they achieve their perfection is the moment you abandon them because some other paradigms replace them. So I suppose depending on how you feel about the iPhone 10, we'll answer this question for you. Um, I know we only have a few minutes before we open up to the audience, so I want to get to some of the structural issues about the French tech and design, and, and particularly the problems with women and entrepreneurship and the ecosystem around it, of course, uh, education and these sorts of things. Um, I guess, Letitia, as a, as a sort of first question on this, I mean, you know, it's interesting here in the United States, you know, women founders is actually declining, not increasing. Um, and, you know, and yeah, the number of women in computer science is also down as well. And so as, some, as a founder who's been in this for 10 years, I'm curious what changes you've seen in both the French tech ecosystem and perhaps larger as well, that, you know, and how, some ideas about how we might reverse this to make this more accessible in, in the French context. So um, what I think is that uh, uh, one issue we have is that there is very, not a lot of women that uh, go to uh, tech uh, or to STEM uh, studies. So uh, uh, to, I think that's one thing that could be done to, to, to make some progress on the number of women going there is really to uh, brand to brand the, the, the school and the, the, the program that are around the tech. 
Uh, I remember I was uh, discussing with a guy of uh, Central Supelec, it's a high school, uh, it's a college in France, and they were uh, defining a new uh, digital uh, uh, something, uh, IT program for engineer. <clears throat> and at the end of the conversation, so we were some experts about this program, they given were thought about that. Uh, one, one of them said that, oh, you know, there is not a lot of women selecting this program, so why? And at the end, the conclusion was, it's not attractive for women. That means it's a computer science, something like that. And, and the conclusion was, if you just put digital or this kind of thing, you can try to make a woman something like a... It's, 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 it's a it makes sense for, for women. So I think that's something that we could uh, work. Uh, and then, obviously, it's to convince uh, to, the, uh, from the high school the girls to go uh, to... Uh, to um, this kind of program. And I think it's uh, things that happen in France uh, where you have some uh, association that are doing some uh, good job to, to, to push girls to go to uh, STEM uh, studies. Uh, on the other side, something that uh, I think that we should continue to push in France is a quota. You know that on the board, uh, uh, there is now a quota for a big company to have women in, uh, in, uh, in their board. So I think this is very positive. There is a lot of uh, talented women that are uh, able to, to be part of the board and so on. So I think this is something to push so we have some role, role model women in big business and so on, and uh, in particular in, in tech. And finally, a, a thing that we just discussed is about fundraising. This is uh, something I have no solution, <laughs> but uh, really the figures in fundraising are very, very low. Even compared to the number of companies funded by women, the amount of money that women raise is very low. So uh, I think that there is a big subject there because without money, you don't do a big company. So, <laughs> so this is something that we should, we should more work more. And this is not specific to France, not at all. It's maybe worse uh, here in the US where the, the, the amount raised by women is uh, decreasing. Pascal, I was, uh, thank you. And, and Pascal, I was hoping you could talk a bit about some of the, you know, whether educational reforms are necessary in France. I mean, given, you know, my American perspective, the perception from here is, of course, is France's education system is very hierarchical and very status-driven. And here in the United States, for example, I went to the University of Illinois, which is a land-grant public school where Mark Andreessen invented the graphical web browser. The founders of YouTube and PayPal, who were children of first-generation immigrants, came out of there, and there's a pipeline of tech. It's not Stanford Business School, but there's a steady stream of workers out of that. And I'm curious, does France have the equivalent of that, and how do you create the sort of feeder system below the elite universities that are sort of the cauldrons of founders of that. Um, there is actually, Greg, uh, a figure I would like to share with you is that, no, it's quite well known today, is that in excess of half of the unicorns created in U.S. are basically done by non-U.S. Uh, born uh, managers or funders, right? Um, and compared to a few years ago, under the, the drive of uh, President Macron, you had an amazing change of minds. In, in France, just a year ago, you had an amazing revolution, right? On that May or June time frame, you have, we moved from a mere 20% to up to 40% of the National uh, Assembly, right? The representatives becoming basically women. We basically dramatically increased, decreased also the youth of that. Uh, exactly what you said on the quota. We are suddenly now putting into the equivalent of your Dow Jones or NASDAQ, essentially the obligations to go at 50% on any of the governance. So I think France is really moving in these directions. Talking about education, something we need to learn from you is that we pretend, maybe with some arrogance, that we've got some of the best engineering school. But the branding we have for them, call them X, Supelec, Central, doesn't mean anything to you. Because we haven't yet been able over these last decades to have the means to carry those messages. And also because maybe we're paying kind of fragmentations. You know, France has been built many years ago We've got more villages than all Europe reunited together. There is something about that which is very specific to France. So learning from actually the Anglo-Saxon world, there is no a clear sense about how we need to drive more money for the private sectors, uh, get the concept of endowments to give a permanence on the financing and the annual planning. And uh, yes, we're learning, we're going there. We obsess also by attracting talent. I don't know if I mentioned that earlier on, but we are very proud today to say that we've got 75% of our PhDs, which are actually 48% of them come from abroad. 
So we are totally open to that. And you may recall the Make Our Planet Great Again saga, where two days after, actually the same day that President Trump decided to quit the COP, uh, President Macron stand up uh, in a French and English video, invited researchers from around the world to come here. And actually at our agency at Business France, we have been instructing many of these, uh, these uh, proposals. So there is a sense of urgency on this, both on the diversity, on the ability to attract talent, on getting basically much more um, close together to basically promote the talent of this country. And just to close, you know, we realized not so long ago that by being able to attract uh, foreign investments, foreign talents, we're actually doing very good for your own country. You know? The foreign companies in France are less than a percent of the total amount. They represent up to 2 million jobs, 11% of the total workforce. They also represent up to 20% of the GDP. But most importantly, they allow us to basically export. So this ability of uh, basically pledging and actually advocating and putting in place diversity and becoming the gate of entry for Europe is critical to all what we're trying to do right now. And what you see above, our presence here at the MoMA, with, uh, and I want to thank you here again, is really basically a, a testimony to, to this new France. France is back, France means business, and there is a new renaissance, go ahead. I, I, I know I'm doing I, my propaganda, I, I, I but what you expect I from never, an ambassador, right? I never knew France went away, but I guess you did. Um, <laughs> We're going to go to the audience for questions in just a moment, but I want to ask Christian one last question. As someone who's running a Grenoble-based company, founded Grenoble, um, how much pressure have you felt so far to relocate out of Grenoble, whether to Paris or beyond, to one of the tech capitals of Europe or arguably the United States of this? How long do you intend to stay in Grenoble? What's going to make it possible for you to stay uh, you know, a local uh, French technology firm? Well, it, actually, it's, it's an interesting question because even though the company is, is Grenoble-based, I'm the only one based in Paris, actually. With a company and, and the reason for that is if you start your business in france obviously paris is is the center of, of many things especially if you want to talk business and, and grow your business and even to travel is is you know is so much easier um, but i think there is no plan to to relocate frankly speaking because grenoble is a is a kind of a unique city i'm not sure how familiar you are you know it's in the French Alps, called Isère. Winter Olympics. Exactly. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's really a, a huge uh, uh, epicenter for engineering research. So even for us to recruit more engineers as we grow, uh, and engineers who are really uh, specialized in the fields that, that matter to us, you know, Grenoble is ideal, frankly speaking. Uh, and on top, it looks like engineers prefer the mountains than the Parisian life. So, so you know, so to answer, to make it short, uh, uh, there's no plan to relocate, essentially. The Alps is a significant recruiting tool, I can imagine, in that particular case. Uh, well, great. Well, now we have time for questions from the audience. I don't know if there's any microphones around or anything else, but uh, do we have any show of hands, uh, particular questions? Anyone? Well, we have one over on this side. Shout it out and I'll repeat it, I guess, worst case. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't hear enough of that myself. Thank you. Yeah, I see your products really nice. I wanted to know how many part of market from Wacom you want to take from next year. Market share question, a market share question for Christian. It's, well, actually, the interest, what I can tell you is, is that, uh, and that's, that will speak more to the French, uh, because there is a famous uh, French uh, retailer called Fnac. I'm sure many of you know them. Um, last year, one out of 10 products uh, that was sold at Fnac was actually one of our products. So I'm, I'm speaking of volumes. Now, now, they have a much wider range, and they cover different price points. So in terms of revenue, we're not there yet. But one out of 10 is not bad, frankly speaking. And to also answer your question differently, we're not necessarily fighting against Wacom, to tell you the truth. We have a product, a spirit, that is completely different because what, what, what we have that Wacom do not have 
is really that capability of using your own paper, your own pens, uh, and that makes us really different. So we're not stealing market share from our main competitor. We're actually adding value and, and, and business uh, to the category. Thank you. Other questions? Raise a hand. We'll run a mic to you if there's any, other out, any others out there. Yes, that, please. Please, madam. It's not really a tech question, um, but I was, uh, it was related to, um, it's more a woman question related to what Leticia said about uh, women on board. And I'm not sure, I'd like you to clarify why you think having quota for uh, women on board is actually a good thing. Because my view is you don't want to have to have women on board just because you have a quota. You want to have women on board because they have the ability and the value to be on that board. Sorry if it's like I'm a bit of launching no, a debate here, but it's, a, it's, it's a, an interesting question. It's a, it's a question that uh, is always asked about that because uh, if we do quota, uh, the, 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 the first uh, we think that uh, we push women and uh, they have not, uh, not for their capa uh, capabilities, but because they are females. So I think that um, the, the, the fact is that we, uh, in the past years, we, we see that, uh, so decades, we see that it don't move. So we thought that women will come in board and it will be uh, the trend and so on. And in the fact, uh, the things are moving very slowly. So the French government said we, we will put a quota so there will be more women. And I think that um, th there, the women that enter board are very qualified women. There is a lot of very qualified women. So you don't have the, the, the non-qualified women that enter to the board. So there are women that can do that. So I think that the, the, the benefit of that is also to show that the, in, the, in big business, you have women. And th you can put that through boards. If, if I may also just answer the questions. There is 40 companies in the CAC 40. There is the SBF 250. Suspect that there is 10 board members there. So we talk about 2,500 plus 400. Let's say 3,000 people. Don't tell me that in France we cannot find 1,500 highly qualified, super duper ladies to be part of the board and take the 50-50. So your question is a very good one, right? Because it's about the debate of the affirmative activities of actions. But when you put that back in perspective, at least in public company, it's a no-brainer. And, um, and we're sure what we're doing and maybe we should just last a few years like uh, the fights and the transparency we need to give on the leveling of the salary, right, which is another big, um, actually, drama and actually scandal. So I think, I think it's time that we get to this and it's happening. And one of the difficulties was to find the woman. So they say, okay, you, you, the company said, you, you told me to have women on board, but I don't know women. And so now in France, uh, we, uh, we have organized some company that the, their, their business is to find women for the board. So they, they have uh, it's like a recruiting process, so you have to be very qualified to enter the board. But there is a lot of women. Thank you. Other questions? Anyone else here? All right, well, perhaps I'll ask one more, and then maybe there'll be others. But oh, I would, I'd ask one that comes to mind real fast for Pascal in this, um, which is that so much in technology, in terms of creating sort of global giants, depends on standard setting. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking again, coming back to the notion of the Japanese, the Japanese technology design of the 1980s and early 1990s was, you know, is fantastic and unique and magical. Um, but they never made it outside of Japan, partly because they had sort of various incompatible standards. So I'm curious, as a, as a, as a French government entity, um, your parts in sort of making sure that France has a seat at the table beyond GDPR and other areas about making sure that the technological standards of tomorrow are defined in part by France. Because the Chinese, you know, right now there's a whole battle over 5G, for example, which my government wants to nationalize for reasons I don't quite understand. Um, I'm curious, what do you think are sort of the core commons or the sort of core technologies and standards um, that France needs to help define so that its technology companies will have a seat at the table in the future? The standards are, are extremely useful in, in, in two or three core areas. Uh, when you basically use radio and exchange of data, right, in whatever shape or form, uh, so that you can basically um, have some input and outputs. And today there is a general understanding that that's happening. And France is playing the role of a middle-sized power, right? Um, having had a clear lead early on on the telcos, typically, and that we kind of lost 
because we've got far too, comp too much competition in Europe compared to the US. We've got 70 telco operators versus only three or four. So we don't have the critical mass to basically go out there, deploy the CapEx and do that. So that's one standard. I think really the standards, and go back to my good old GDPR, is really about what is the rule you define to, to create this new gold called data. Uh, and there is a, a gold rush, a data rush. And if you don't define the shape, the form, the way you can attract, define, share this data, you're an issue. The health industry will be revolutionized when basically all of the hospital will have find an agreement, not only in France, but across Europe, across the US, about how you exchange data. Um, health public policy will be dramatically upgraded when you will be able to, put, to detect early on many diseases. So I think that's the second core thing. We need to be obsessed about how we're going to define the standard around the data and what will be the rule to exchange it and not to abuse of them. And the third one on standard is really about um, uh, the amazing uh, processing power, right? You do understand that what is needed today when you have um, Alibaba, which is doing in one day, on a single day, 22 billion dollars of, uh, uh, of sales, which is equivalent to uh, millions of transactions, right? The ability for you to basically encompass this power, to treat this information, to stock, to have the memory for that, requires standards, because that's how you scale, right? So top of my mind, that's two or three ideas, but the one on data is absolutely fundamental. Any last questions then? Yes, the last question, please. Here comes the microphone. Thank you. Uh, so I was wondering, so as a tech developers, tech entrepreneurs, so if uh, like the next move uh, in terms of people is to work with more women, what would be the next step in terms of technology? The, the next step to jump in? Like, what would you say? What's the, what's the next big thing you're asking? Yes, kind of. <laughs> I say this is this is. I was thought we were going to make it through this panel without having to mention blockchain, but we might be stuck mentioning blockchain. Maybe, but hopefully, none of us believe that. Maybe but. like a thought or something. Anything. You mean for women or no, no, like in terms of technologies, like like maybe if you you were saying that um, using smartphone uh, is becoming useless, so what will be next? Okay. I say smartphone will change, will be split. <laughs> Um. Well, I'll, I'll, let's reframe it that way. Since one thing we didn't cover, which I actually do think is interesting, does anyone have any particular closing thoughts on the role of artificial intelligence and machine uh, learning in your, in your businesses and also how it applies to the French tech scene? Because that is the other great pivot that is happening here too, where AI is reaching its mainstream penetration. So particularly in you know, the urban environment, various AI is running as well. Yes, so this is what, what we... we, we uh, we use AI to uh, create pattern on the, to, to recognize the movement of, of people in the city. So we use data, set of data, data set to recognize that someone is doing, uh, is biking or is uh, doing, uh, uh, is walking or is uh, uh, waiting somewhere and so on. Um, so I think AI in all industry is uh, uh, transforming all industry and uh, now thanks to that we have capacity to dematerialize, dematerialize what we were, we need the hardware before to do, to do that. Just one thing, <laughs> you are a developer, so uh, a woman developer, I think that uh, something that we, um, we, we saw is that there is uh, on the all uh, around mathematics, intelligence artificial, there is more women that are um, are coming uh, to us, and we can find more women that are uh, not developer, but uh, data scientists. Uh, so this is uh, something that uh, women love. Craig, if I was 20 years old today, I would do five things, five areas. First, I would go on the share economy, because thanks to my damn iPhone, we empower a lot of more people, so they can share a lot more stuff. Secondly, I will be a focus on uh, artificial intelligence. Thirdly, I will go on uh, essentially linking to blockchain. Uh, fourth, I will think about uh, the cloud computing and what we call the edge computing, which is about how you'd process stock uh, large shares of data. And being you, I still will maintain design, right? And the ability to create beautiful stuff as a core stuff. So you see, you've got five shots out of this meeting. Go out and uh, change the world, right? As is in that. All right? Any, I would say yes. A, a design in particular, anything that frees us from just slabs of glass is the defining uh, tech paradigm. So, all right, with that, thank you all so much for coming. After this, I want to encourage you to have 
More champagne. I guarantee this is the only New York Design Week party that is serving real champagne, not Prosecco. Thank you, friends. Thank you. Yes, worthy of applause. Truly, thank you to our host, Moma, and, and, and Mom for serving champagne. Uh, and one round of applause for our panelists. Thank you so much. Natisha, Christian, Pascal. And thank you. Thank you for coming.